Welcome to Go Away. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We're the best. Alright. <laughs> this is gonna sound terrible, but I was distracted. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, damn it, there's a little black hair in this tape. <laughs> Alright, here's like the story. eyebrow hair or something. Alright, here's the story. Uh, that's what you think. <laughs> so, here's the story. Uh, <laughs> I have a tradition. And tradition is to get smashed on a certain day when a certain thing happens. And I will not disclose what it is, but I do it every time. And today was the day. And I didn't get smashed because it takes commitment, but I did get, like, drunk enough so I'm, like, funny on the internet. And in this particular moment, someone I know, like, messages me and asks for my opinion on his drawing, and it's like a, um, a self-portrait of himself. <laughs> and I have artist friends that are great, artist friends that are not so great, and then they're complete beginners, and I'm, I'm like supportive and helpful usually with everybody, especially with beginners, because they need like... They, yeah, they need it the most. They need it the most. But this one is not, like this guy is not my artist friend. This is just somebody that I know. Like, this is one of those rare cases, cases where it's a person that's just a guy I know, right? But he knows that I'm an artist, and he sometimes draws, like, just for fun. Mm -hmm. So he dared to ask my opinion. <laughs> what a fool. What a fool. Uh, you see, I would have been nicer, but I was drunk. And here's the thing, here's the problem. He's a new by like a newbie, total like new but what who am I kidding? He's a shit in this. He's a shit. A shit. Yeah, he's not the shit. He's a shit. So the problem with this is that when everybody starts drawing and he's like very much in there, he's not shit, like completely. He's still better than a lot of beginners that like draw stick figures, right? Mm -hmm. But if he would like ask money for this, he would get on delusional artists immediately. Um, yeah. That's that's the thing, and here's there's no like easy way to break it to someone like that. That he, you see the problem with with this is you're trying to draw realism, and you can't because you're just not there. A that's reason one, and reason two is the whole problem is that realism is something you need to understand. Like you need to see differently because you think you're drawing something but really what you're drawing is an idea of something you think you know what something looks like but you don't you need to look at it you need to analyze it you need to like study it with your eyes like objectively you think this is an eyebrow but it isn't it's like shapes and forms and you know like so that's and this is like a talk that has to happen with everybody who needs to understand how to draw realism at least mm -hmm. on some like somewhat realistic level because if, if you're like, you don't have to be hyper realistic, you just need to, if you just want to be a little bit realistic, you need to get that, because after that you can actually start understanding how light works, how line works, how shapes work, how everything works, like, well, you know. But this conversation has to happen, and basically it's like, look, you just don't, you just don't have eyes. You, you think you're doing a thing, but you're just doing everything wrong, and it has to happen, otherwise the person will not get it. Mm -hmm. It, it can be like more nicer, like in a nicer form. Like you see what happens is that you draw this way, but really you need to understand this, right? And the person might get it, but mm -hmm. because I was drunk, <laughs> oh no, I I decided not to like beat around the bush or just like do the thing that a lot of people don't do and like well a lot of people just don't they give critiques like they just like say yeah it looks alright. And just like keep keep trying, man. <laughs> keep practicing. You, <laughs> you know, sure like, did that. You sure did that, right? Yeah. Like we have a list. You have you found a list of like what eleven things to say to an artist when they show you their work. Amazing list. Mm -hmm. But it's somewhere. Don't ever let anyone tell you you didn't do that. <laughs> yes, that's that's one of the best ones. Uh, so yeah, and because of me being drunk, and because that is the step where this guy is, like he needs to have that conversation to understand that he's not doing the thing, he's doing what he thinks he's doing, but really he's just being wrong. 
he, he thinks he's drawing realistically, but really he's drawing like ideas and stigma that are very elaborate, right? Mm -hmm. So I, uh, that's where the conversation went immediately. And, and here's the thing, it didn't help that I know this guy is very self-conscious uh -oh. and very like awkward. But mm -hmm. he's the kind of awkward that doesn't want to be awkward, so he's very self-conscious and he, he has very like obvious issues with um, confidence. Mm -hmm. Like very obvious. Like for example, you know how like a good way to tell you anybody a joke is to tell a joke and just let it hang, right? But mm -hmm. he, he's the guy who would tell a joke, copy like the image, like take a picture of it and send it to you and say, Hey, I made a joke. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, it, I guess it would make sense if you're like an actual comedy writer or something, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not. Is he a self-quarter? Uh, Please tell me he is No, isn't. he's not. Okay. He's, he's, right. he's intelligent. Like, you know how a lot of people that are, like, are, like, awkward, they tend to be intelligent, on the intelligent side. Mm -hmm. And he is not all the way into, I am very smart. Alright. But he, he is the one that wants to be there without realizing it yet, because he's young, he's like 15, right? But oh, okay. He, he, you might remember I mentioned him before. Mm -hmm. Like, so he can appear to be pretentious, but it's mostly due to age and, you know, and he never went all the way. I am very yeah. smart, so I forgive him. But, like, he has confidence issues, and on top of all that, I was just like, Yeah, shit, man. <laughs> it's all crap. You don't understand. Like, but I wasn't like that bad. I was just, like, it was one of those ones, like, What do you think? And then I just take a gulp from my, like, bottle. Like, I'm sitting on a porch somewhere in Washington. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just sitting on the porch, being all like lonely, like and I'm unshaven three days, very like kind of yeah, character. Like basically, I'm straight out of like Bukowski's book, and I, <laughs> like he comes up to me like this young, non-confident boy, and shows me the picture and goes like, "What do you think?" I look at it, I take a like a whiff of Jack, <laughs> say, and I just I start with saying, "Look," <laughs> and and immediately you know. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Hmm? You sent me a picture of a girl putting a celery into her boogoo. That is a leak. Is it? Yeah. Oh, is, is, that, is that the joke? Like, yeah. <laughs> I've sprung a leak. So, how are we on the comic news this week? Oh, pretty good. Um. So, for all of our lo loyal listeners, um, <laughs> the comics I talk about and I say this week, by the time the episode gets uploaded, it's actually more like last week's. Oh, yeah. So. Okay, if you're listening to this, I just want to say we don't care <laughs> if we're being very, very, like, on time with the news. So, if, if we're saying this week or something, it might have been like a month ago. <laughs> I still give good comics advice. Oh, definitely. But just be aware that it's most likely at least a week old. At least, yeah. We're not necessarily trying to stay up to date very much. Anyway, so yeah. this week, um, Image, of course, came out with a lot of good stuff. Um, so I know that even though I have a big boner for Alan Moore and Alan Moore hates Grant Morrison because Alan Moore feels like Grant Morrison steals... Well, stole all of his ideas and tried to be Alan Moore 2.0. Mm -hmm. But um, Grant Morrison, I've actually never read any of his stuff, even though I want to read Doom Patrol and I want to read Animal Man. Mm -hmm. Never read his stuff. But he has a new monthly series coming out through Image called Nameless about like um, an astronaut who killed his family and. I think I, I think I've seen posts about that online. Nameless sounds very familiar. Yeah. Astronaut. Yeah. yeah. And there's a dude who can go into, like, this kind of Lovecraftian dream world, and he takes dream keys for people, and there's, like, something going on that they need him to help stop. Um, so, I gotta say, it was, it was really good. The only thing with Grant Morrison is, I guess I haven't 
I've, I have read some Grant Morrison because he wrote Batman Incorporated, but mm-hmm. um, he's he always insists on using Chris Burnham as an artist, and that's that's fine. I mean, they're buds, I guess. But um, Chris Burnham has this really like it kind of reminds me of, like a little bit of the old Ninja Turtles comic style, if like you cleaned it up a bit or mm-hmm. made it look look fresher. All right. Um, or I'll, send, I'll send you like a, an image sample oh. so you can know what I mean. All right. Um, but they're like everyone looks like an angry midget. That's <laughs> the thing. See, like look at that one. Oh, oh, I know this artist. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, no, I know, I know. This like artist. he's not bad, but his style no, 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 no. He's looks not. funky. It's it's very specific. Yeah. He's one of those artists that got to be professional before they, like, went all the way learning realism. Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of, like, it's like quasi-realism, so you don't yeah. necessarily care about everything being perfect, so your proportions are slightly towards something you want yeah. it to be, which it's is a little, fine. It's a little cartoony, but I mean, I, I can dig it. It works. Um, but anyway, Nameless, it's definitely pretty fucking good. I would check it out. Um, uh, what else happened? Um, Postal got its first issue through Image and Top Cow Comics. Um, I'm gonna ask this question for, just because I want uh, this to be mentioned. It has nothing to do with the game. No. Nothing to do with the game. All right. um, so what it is, is it's kind of like a, like a Noir is not really quite the right word, but it's like a kind of murder mystery, uh, murder mystery thriller thing in the vein of like, um, like X Files and Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. And the dude who's doing all the investigating is this um, this little mailman dude um, mm-hmm. with like autism or ADHD or something like that. I don't remember because I read it like a few days ago. Have you seen Monk, the series? No. I haven't, but I've heard that it's about something like that. Like, the detective has mm. OCD, so he's very... Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah. I haven't actually seen it. Close but of it so I don't what know. makes Postal interesting, besides the fact that it's the detective is a fucking mailman with autism, um, is that it's set in a town called Eden that's populated entirely by Two criminals. <laughs> Um, oh, I see. Irony. Yeah. Um, everyone's a criminal, including the mayor, except for people who were born there. So, like, the postal, the mailman dude, he's young enough that he was born there and he has no criminal record, and he's just a mailman. But So, like, if, if you're born there, you just fucked? No. I mean, the thing about Eden is it's populated by criminals, but they don't, they're not allowed to break laws or some crazy shit happens. Oh, so it's just... Everybody with a criminal record is there, but it's still a normal place. It's not like a prison. It's not well, like Arkham City or anything. Normal, quote unquote. Um, I don't want to spoil anything too much, but it's pretty intriguing. Like, there's seems to be like a lot of. I don't really want to say conspiracy, but like that kind of conspiracy-ish type thing going on. Like, there's a deeper, there's a deeper vein running through the whole thing, and then like the back of the book has like all these personnel files that are kind of like CIA slash police file style mm. things. Um, and I don't know where, you don't know where they came from because it's not really explaining anything right now. Mm. So that's interesting. It's going to be so uh, it's, interested to see where it goes. So for those who want to see a world and explore it on their own, there is by like uh, getting bits of, bits of information like one at a time. And explore it like that mm-hmm. instead of just being shoved exposition to their face. It's like, like great, great. Yeah, it's, what I'm it's perfect for that. All right, all right. And then, yeah, sweet. which is issue four came out. Um, it's great as always. Scott Snyder is a fantastic writer, and the people he has doing art for this one, um, just top notch. Um, I've actually I had never heard of the artist before, but I really like what they're doing. Um, they only go by Jock. Oh, I know Jock. Everybody fucking knows Jock. Oh, that he did the Batman Black Mirror, but yeah, what he's, everybody knows Jock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so what he's doing with this one is um, he draws everything by 
hand and lays it in there. But then he has um, the colorist give him... He has, like, general colors, and he'll put, like, this effect over the entire comic that kind of looks like you're looking at at it through, like, a screen door. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, um, there'll be splatters Mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing that are, like, transparent. So, like, it creates this really, like, murky, unsettling, like, motif through the whole thing. Yep. Um, so it's working really, really well, and I really like it. Like, the art and writing, and you can tell they love the comic, um, love doing it. Mm. Uh, yeah, which is very important. Mm-hmm. You can always you can always tell if an artist likes doing their thing, or if they're just, eh. It's yeah. Thing. Yep. Anyway, uh, had a huge fucking twist at the end of this. Um, makes me raise my eyebrow a little bit at if the mom is doing some shady business, but I don't want to spoil too much, um, especially since uh, since it's issue four, I would imagine that the trade paperback will be coming out fairly soon, since usually the trade trades have like five or six issues in them, so, mm. you know. Um, so I don't really want to say too much, but I would absolutely check out Witches. It's very, very interesting, and it's not about like freaking chicks riding around on broomsticks. It's a lot more like primordial and sinister than that. Yeah, I remember you very much liking the very first uh, issues. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, Miracle Man. Of course, Marvel's finally reprinting that. Um, anybody who's actually reading comics at all knows that. Um, Alan Moore series, one of his first um, for the deconstruction in terms of superheroes. Um, of course, because Alan Moore hates Marvel and DC nowadays, <laughs> He doesn't. He doesn't want his name anywhere on it. So even though they're reprinting it, um, if you didn't know it was Alan Moore, you would never know unless you like looked it up on Wikipedia because it just says by the original writer. Um, really? I never knew that. Yeah, but uh, this one was probably like the one of the darkest and most affecting issues ever because um, I told you about like Young Nasty Man, who's basically Black Adam. Um, mm-hmm. So the thing with this one is Young Nasty Man is what happened to Kid Miracle Man when he became isolated from Miracle Man and had no guidance. Um, mm-hmm. So he's like a fucking, he's a teenager with all this power. Oh, and that, that's terrible. Like, yeah, so that causes him to become something not so great. And then, like a bajillion issues back, they thought they had stopped it by trapping like Young Nasty Man kind of inside the inside Johnny Bates who is the who is the kid who's young Miracle Man um, because the way it works is like oh man I don't want to explain too much but you have um, the way the superhero system in this one works is it's like from the Cold War from the 50s an alien ship landed that had some technology of some sort and then um, like all these scientists took it so they could create an Ubermensch and um, what happened was they figured out that you could keep the Ubermensch in a different dimension type thing, and then you would have a keyword that would like switch you, even though, but you'd still be occupying the same consciousness, if mm. that makes any idea. If that makes any idea, if that makes any sense. Like um, Thor. Kind of, yeah. Um, that's why I, went, I showed you that one page where, like, it had all the dead things that had that, but they all had, like, two skeletons fused into one. Mm. So when you die, that's what happens. The two bodies fuse together. Mm. Um, yeah. But oh. this one, yeah. Yeah, I want to clarify. it. For if, if you were born too late to read the original comics, or maybe they're still doing that, I'm not sure. Thor is not just a god in the Marvel comic book universe. He used to be, at least. Mm-hmm. He was also a dude. Yep. And they just share the body, and when he sees some shit, he just goes like, Ah, better call my super thing, and he there switches, a... but now it's just like a, a Thor dude that's just in a place. And he doesn't need to share a body or have a secret identity or anything. Yeah, just, I've yep. just put this out there. There was an old Outer Limits episode about that, I think, but anyway, I don't want to get out <laughs> off on a tangent. Um, yeah. Anyway, so this one, Young Nasty Man, um, fucking Miracle Man was with Miracle Woman who just showed up a little while ago um, 
they were with these aliens who like had this council of like intelligent races and then they took notice of Miracle Man and Miracle Woman and were like, well crap, now we gotta do something about humanity because mm. they have this power now of Miracle Man and Miracle Woman. Um, so they were up there like on a satellite on the dark side of the moon, not satellite on the dark side of the moon, but I think they were on the dark side of the moon like just kind of hanging around and then they noticed that some freaky shit was going on in London and so it cuts down to there and it's like hell on earth um because young nasty man broke out of johnny bates's mind so he's back um and he just wants to fuck everything up like there are people like impaled london's just burning to the ground their skins hanging on clotheslines there are women walking around with their hands cut off um like all that kind of stuff and it's really like Ugh. And, like, probably the best line, like, just really effective line in that was, like, it has a narration from Miracle Man running through the whole thing, and it's over the fight scene when he's trying to stop um, Young Nasty Man, but obviously it's too fucking late because shit's gone down the drain. But the, the probably most effective line in that whole comic was... Um, in the narration when Miracle Man's fighting Young Nasty Man and he picks up a car and uh, he says, there are some apologists who will say that the car that I threw at him was empty. And then he throws it. And then the next line in the narration is, I'm sorry to say that that is not the truth. <laughs> and, like, you have to realize that now, with, since we've had Frank Miller and everybody... Like, having that gritty, awful side of a superhero isn't really anything new. But at that time, um, in the very early 80s, that would have been something extremely shocking. Um, Wait, so are you saying that this is the whole, like, deconstruction of a superhero even before we had all these, like, Frank Millery things? Yeah. Oh. I had so, no idea. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, so that's that was... not surprising that Alan Moore was the first one to do anything like that, really. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, we know that he did Watchmen, but I didn't know about, like, Miracle Man. Mm -hmm. Well, hardly anyone knew, except for super <laughs> comic nerds. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're a real comic book person, like, I think, if, if you were a real comic book person, I think, like, reading, like, Sandman and Alan Moore stuff, like, mm -hmm. especially mostly his, like, graphic novels is like a must yeah like how can you call yourself a real comic book geek and i don't mean like nerd like <laughs> batman <laughs> but like i mean like serious like i really love the medium i'm gonna write a paper about it no i'm not wearing shorts <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah. uh and then man i don't want to spoil the story too much but like you're super excited about it. That's yeah, it was. Myself. This was probably the best issue so far. Um, yeah. So eventually, I don't want to say how. I want to leave some stuff for people to discover. But um, <laughs> they stop Young Nasty Man, and he reverts back to um, being Johnny Bates. And then um, Miracle Man goes over to Johnny Bates, and Johnny Bates remembers him, of course. And he's like, "Oh, you stopped it." There must be some way to make this never happen again, because, like, it looks... Keep in mind, it looks like hell on Earth at this time. And mm -hmm. and then Miracle Man's, like, hugging him and holding him like a baby, because, you know, he's like a son to him, kind of. Um, and he's like, yes, there is a way to stop this. And then you see in the next panel, it's just a close-up, and he snaps the kid's neck. And then the issue just ends drops the mic. Like, oh, that was mm, so powerful. Whoa. Here you go. Right in front of the pros. And then Batman Eternal. Okay. <laughs> they tie, they tied it in this this week with uh with Gotham Academy. Mm -hmm. Um the chemistry professor from Gotham Academy was doing some freaky shit. Um kinda like a fear toxin, but instead of making you scared it made you hyper aggressive yeah. um 
that's about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that all the comics? No, no, Future's End. Um, oh, right. <laughs> Future's End, Brainiac, the huge, enormous god, is on Earth now. Oh. And he's fucking everything up. Is so, it like women with no hands, hell on Earth, bodies in space? <laughs> no, it's not that messed up yet. Oh. Well, I don't they think they never... could make it that messed up because it's only rated teen. They would never do anything good with anything. They just can't put blood and fucking cut faces off, but no. <laughs> not anything well, important can happen in a story. You gotta remember Batman's rated teen plus, which is just below mature, so that's why they could have Joker cut his face off and everything. Yeah, it would be really weird if it was just teen. But anyway, oh yeah, and John John's Bistro Business Venture. Ah, yeah, what about that one? I've heard it's, things it's, about it, but I haven't seen anything. It's been getting a, it's been getting a Tonko Bond release, and a lot of people confuse this with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but this manga was actually first and what? won a bajillion awards. What? Um, <laughs> wait, yep. wait, wait. The, the JoJo was in like 80-something. Yeah. And it was before that? Who wrote mm -hmm. it? Who wrote jo uh, John? I don't remember his name. Let me let me look it up. All right. Uh, Sakuji Ito. Oh and shit. So JoJo's has his focus on like fashion, but well, now John John John's John's is a little weird because it focuses on the food industry as how it pertains to the music world. Wow. So wait, um, are you reading it like? Now, did you get into it finally? You, you've been talking about how you wanted to start reading it, but I know you don't read like manga online or anything like that. You, you read it. Yeah, I need physical have, media. So, did you finally get it? Yeah, I found there's this obscure publisher that's doing uh, like a translated Tonkaban release. Uh -oh. the, the one bad thing is they did the thing where they mirror flip it. Ah. So, that's a little messed up. Shit. But, so. What happens is, John John, he finds this turtle of time, uh -huh. and it tells him to start a restaurant so that he can save Motley Crue. Oh. <laughs> wait, wait, really? Like, the Motley Crue? Yep. Wait, wait, wait. Jeez. Or was it Motley Crue? Oh, I just farted. <laughs> Alright, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Molly Crew, it was Def Leppard. Um, oh. Alright. But anyway, so he needs to start a restaurant so he can save Def Leppard. And the way that's going to happen is that his bar slash restaurant will grow big enough that it can also become a concert venue host. And he's going to host the first Def Leppard concert in Japan. But that's only the first volume. I don't really know what else is going to happen after that. But I know that this thing won a lot of awards, so I just don't know how it fell off the face of the earth. Um, oh, hey, if it's like old, does this mean that it's like a very like old school drawing and very kind of like yeah. almost bad art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Big Jojo has thing. that too, like the first issue. Well, it was revolutionary for the time, but it looks like shit now. But, mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, you're not the one to bitch about art normally, especially with old stuff. I mean, well, old stuff you... gets a little bit of a pass. Yeah, I mean, you've read goddamn Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so I don't know how that is possible. <laughs> I'm sorry, old Kevin. Indie I'm sorry, stuff Kevin. especially gets a pass. I'm sorry, Kevin. <laughs> I didn't hey, mean that. he's still doing the covers for the new ones published by IDW. Uh, yeah, I know. It's just sweet. I mean, he deserves... I think it's thing. awesome that they at least have one of the original dudes for the new ones. Oh. Because he's doing the story, too. Huh. Ah. Alright, so, one thing I want to mention is that, well, I'm an artist, and my friend here is, is a writer, and you would expect if we were writing a comic book or something like that, we would, like, I would do the art, and he would do the writing. Well, we decided that it's too boring. We decided that we're cooler than that. We decided to challenge yourself, so we're making one comic where I'm the writer, <laughs> and my friend is gonna be the artist. I hope you guys are ready. It's gonna be the best, mm -hmm. the best comic book series of all time. Mm -hmm. So soon, coming soon. We will when we will finish it. 
We'll have to make like an Imgur album or maybe a DeviantArt. We will make Just it. Kidding. We will make it. We will upload it somewhere on DeviantArt or ArtStation or anything. We will make it happen. It will go and print. We will sell it on Lulu as a digital <laughs> download. It will be available. <laughs> I promise we will deliver. We'll post links everywhere when it comes out. Yeah. I don't know how much time will it take. It's probably going to be sooner than later. But you're doing well, the cover, though. I, I'm doing the cover because we want to want to be very cool about it. So, yeah. 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 If I'm doing the cover, you're going to write the description and the blurb. <laughs> well, since this is a Western comic, they usually don't have blurbs on them. But in the description field, there has to be something, so that's going to oh, be okay. So oh, okay. <laughs> it's your solve. So yeah, we're going to do that, and we will keep you updated when we have something to show. It looks good so far. Yeah, I've seen some panels from the comic book. Oh man, you have, you have to see it to believe it. <laughs> it's great. Story's good, too. Mm. I'm... A master of the feather. You know. You mean the quill? The proverb. Yes. The proverbial quill. <laughs> Amazing. I'm a master of the feather. So yeah, I've decided that I will budge eventually and get a Pokemon game. But because I, I, I can't be asked, I'll just go straight and insert X and Y. Mm -hmm. and since well, I'm, or you could do the remakes of... um. But I want to see of, um, Kalos and everything. I want to see this Frenchy looking. Kalos. Yeah, you got to do that one first. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm into that shit. So, and of course you're gonna be a girl because they get more fashion choices. See, I was thinking about that. Like, actually, maybe I do want to be a guy. Maybe I'm gonna take this seriously. Make it real team. Call my Pokemon something real. But then, but then I remember that I was like, nope, chick all the way. You always gotta be a girl. You always gotta be a girl, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always a girl. You're just a girl, period. <laughs> you're a girl inside. In my soul. In your soul. You, you're not only a little girl. You're just, well, I mean, you're not just a girl, you are a little girl, specifically. <laughs> like, you're the one that sits in front of the tape and goes, Eat the Pokemon! And it's all also has to be a Japanese girl because you're <laughs> a weeboo. In the best kind of sense of the word, some some people say we trash is a term, but I don't know. That sounds a bit harsh, but then again, we both has a more <laughs> negative connotation, so I wouldn't know. I had a conversation with my friend, who's also an artist, about fan art, mm -hmm. and it was interesting because I was like, "Man, I hate people who do fan art," and she was, "I'm sorry." Like, yeah, don't they suck? They have oh, nothing no. original to say. And it's just like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and I kept on going, like, oh, like it's like, God. why do you do it if you, if you have nothing original to say? And like, I was just like, writing shit like that. And I mean, I knew that she was, was doing fan art, mostly. But I wanted to be shocking, like, you know, like, because I'm a dick. <laughs> a lot of mm -hmm. the time. Like, I was like, Oh, it's, they suck so much, and, and and then she was like, "Well, I do." Like, finally, she decided just to go ahead. Well, I do fan art most of the time. I'm like, no, you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, "What?" And then I decided to explain that I'm actually did. And what I actually mean is like when people ride the fan art wave. Is what I was actually talking about. See, fan art is like. There are two points about it. First of all, well, you gotta understand that if you're doing two fan coins, art, right? two sides of the coin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, so what I meant is that usually people who do fan art do it for two reasons, and it's like, well, one of like it can be a combination of both, but mostly the reason number one, you're actually a fan of something and you want to depict it, mm -hmm. and. The other reason is you want some publicity, and yeah, and like I would like to. I'm, I thought about it and I thought about talking about it, and I decided that I'm not gonna name names and talk shit on other artists mm -hmm. that are way more successful than I am <laughs> because well, <laughs> it's just not cool. 
even if it's just for that reason. But, what I do want to say is that I really think that writing the fan art wave is kind of eh. And I know like you can do that and put on Patreon and earn $25,000 a month. <laughs> Take a moment there. <laughs> but, I mean, so, some people would talk about like, you know, artistic value and stuff. But, well, here's my like other opinion. So if you do fan art if, and you're doing it well, it has to be something you actually like. And here's when I need to specify this. Because there's a lot of things people like, right? And you know, okay, okay. You know this whole nerd culture that's very popular and there's like shows about it, yeah, TV, goddamn it. Like, nerd becoming mainstream, like comic books are becoming mainstream. Now we're the OG here, we talk about comics, nobody talks about it. Screw Batman. Except we don't talk about Batman. <laughs> yeah, and actually I think most yeah. of the comics I talked about people, at least a few people are talking about. Well, except for John Johns. I don't know anything that you're talking about. I'm not here to judge. I'm just, again, being a dick for no reason, really. But what I'm really saying is that, like, the whole nerd culture is becoming, like, mainstream, and it's kind of silly at times. And it's like, yeah, I like Mario too. I like Nintendo, right? I like Zelda. And sure you like it, sure you might have played the game and liked it, but I bet that most of the people who played it and really loved it, like, it means so much to them. There aren't many of those. Yeah. Like, most people who are into that and like, haha, nerd culture, like, I'm not like talking about fake geeks because this is just stupid, right? Like, yeah. Like, I'm talking like, actually loving something like loving like just liking a game that Nintendo made and enjoying it a lot uh, is not the same as really loving it like breathing and living it and I'm sure that not a lot of people can say that they really feel like that about like Mushroom Kingdom hmm. I think Movie Bob is an enormous fan of Mario Universe like all the way legit but I'm not sure I don't know him personally so you know but what I'm saying is, if you were like that, that's when you actually are a fan of something, and that's and that's why it's up to you to make that fan art, because you have the unique inside it, because you love it so much, you're not like other people anymore. Like, you have a very intimate relationship with this property, and it's like one-sided, of course, but, you know, you're the only person who can do justice to the thing. And not make it true, but have a very unique take on it. Yeah. Because you like it so much. But I don't mean like uh, depicting it in a true fashion or something. That's just stupid. But like really having like something to say about it for reals. For reals. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. And then on the other hand, you have people who are on both cities, so they're just like, uh, I'm gonna draw a cowboy. Everybody likes Hellboy. I mean, yeah, everybody does, but you drawing Hellboy doesn't mean that people like you drawing Hellboy. They mean yeah. you're just gonna like you because you drew a thing they like. It's mm -hmm. not helping you, but you did get those views, I guess. Shout out. <laughs> no. Oh, also, just to mention it, because I said it, the whole thing about Big Geek, that's just stupid, isn't it? Like, yeah, overall, like, I mean... Yeah, it's, it's like you need to be this nerdy. Like, imagine that, like, you know the rides in the yeah. parks? Like, you have to be this tall to be on the ride. It's like, you need to be this nerdy to and be accepted into nerddom. That's There's bullshit. nothing wrong with being a casual fan. Um, I don't think you even, like, need to be anything, like... Well, yeah, hey, there's nothing wrong with just being a casual fan of something. Like, yeah, you don't like that. We were talking about, like, Constantine and how some fans are ridiculously, hilariously don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but, I mean, it doesn't have to be bad. Like, they're just enjoying it for what it is, right? It's not bad. Yeah. So, well, and everyone started somewhere. So. Yeah, everybody started somewhere. But if you're so. a dick to them, they're not going to explore deeper. Well, Everybody knows that nerds have a little bit of like this is our territory complex. Like they want mm -hmm. to defend it. Like it's never you. Like yeah, 
Yeah. So, that's stupid, and it, like, I think you, you can still be nerd if you're, like, not into things that normal nerds are into. Yeah. Like, and you don't have to be nerd about everything, you can be just nerd about one thing. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be anything that normally look is looked on, like... Like, I, I still think that you can be a total nerd if you're, like, very nerdy about music history. Like, all the way, you go, like, talk about Hildegard von Bingen, and that's your thing. Some yeah. people say that's academic, but if you're actually enjoying that outside of, like, academia, or even yeah. better, that's your hobby, <laughs> like, then I think it's very clear that you're a true nerd in the best sense of the word, and not the bad one. And it's okay, yeah. and you're still a nerd, and it, you don't have to like Mario now. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, uh, you're like, if no, if no one here knows, uh, you're a composer, and and a writer, and a writer of many well, talents. Like, you many things, mm. Jack of ladies. Mm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you finished a piece recently, and I've seen bits of it. And I actually don't think I've ever seen the whole thing together, but I think you just published it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've got a couple that I published earlier or something. Yeah, so, I mean, like, now that you published it, do you, like, do you want to talk about what you feel about it? Do you feel proud of it? Do you feel like it's a, yeah. good, it's a good thing you did? Alright, talk, talk me through it. I feel the, good about it. Um, talk I'll, I'll talk about the most recent one. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I am trying to maintain at least some level of anonymity, so I'm not going to like name it or where it's published or anything. Um, I don't know that it could cost me sense, but whatever. Um, so it's an arrangement of an old Scottish folk tune, um, of an air. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm really into folk music, uh, which you know, but our listeners do not know. Um, <laughs> I am very, very much into traditional folk music, of various kinds, but I do have a thing, quite a big thing for Celtic music, especially. Um, and what I knew I wanted to do was arrange this, at least for a solo instrument and guitar, because I've, for a while now I've been writing music for an album I want to record for that one mythical day in the far future where I have money to rent out a recording studio. But, that's besides the point. Um, so what I ended up actually doing was arranging this for a solo instrument and concert key. There's also the option of having it be English horn, um, which is in the key of F, for those of you who do that do not know. <laughs> concert key is the key of C, which uh -huh. means that every note you play is actually the note that's written. So like for English horn, if you play an E, that's actually a concert A. So that explains the difference there um, for those folks that don't know. Anyway. Um, so I ended up actually doing it for solo instrument, guitar, and piano, and it does have the option of doing just solo instrument and guitar, or just solo instrument and piano, but, um, uh, and I did kind of keep sort of quasi-traditional form, where there's, you play the tune just straight with no fancy stuff added, and then you play it a second time with ornaments, and there might be something in the middle, but, because... We're talking about me. Um, I did sort of modernize it a little bit. Um, innovative. Like, sure. I don't think anything I really do is innovative. It's just well, not really. really. Nobody is really, really innovating if they're not doing some very tricky shit. Yeah. In the um, composition world. I do think I use some techniques that people do. Clusters. Kind of shy away from yeah, clusters. I, I love clusters. clusters. You like clusters, but the truth is, clusters are just like the only place it's ever used, like metal and like unusual metal like that too. Mm -hmm. It's like like you're just talking like popular genres and stuff. It's never barely ever used. Barely ever used. Even like, in academic music, it's not used all that much. Well, academic music is all about doing new shit and doing whatever the hell you want. Not, you know, if yeah, but I be... haven't seen a whole lot of prominent stuff with clusters that's older than, like, or that's newer than, um, like, maybe the 70s. Well, yeah, I mean, but then again, who writes that kind of music anyway after that time? Yeah, good point. Anyway, yeah. um, 
So it doesn't have clusters until this section in the in the middle when the piano and the guitar have like not really a solo section, but it's kind of like just a little <sighs> intermezzo is not really the right word, but it's a little interlude between the two sections, the plain and the ornamented. Um, and the textures are more for te the texture. The <laughs> <laughs> the clusters are more for texture. Um, but the thing that I do when I compose, which could be a detriment, could not be, it's kind of the same thing that I do when I write, is I might have a general idea in my head um, of how I want it to go and some highlights that need to happen, but for the most part, I let things happen organically. Um, and I recently found out that just saying organically for people who haven't been around the arts world can be confusing for some people. Um, in the arts, if you're doing something organically, you're not following a formula, you're just letting it happen naturally um, mm -hmm. and seeing what happens. Um, so, you know, all you scientists out there going, how oh, does this have to do with things being based in carbon? Um, it doesn't have to do with that at all. It's just sort of like a misuse of it, but, you know. Oh, yeah. So, so are the arts. Um, a lot of terminology in arts is just kind of weird. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I go very, very organically for the most part, except for like landmarks that I know I want to hit. Um, so I don't know if that's a detriment or not yet. Um, so far it's working out for me. I can confidently say right now that I think most of the music I've written is pretty good. Um, <laughs> But, I, you know, I'm only 22. Um, maybe in a few years we'll find out I'm a hack, but... Well, you're, you're, I can already say that you're a hack from a point of view of academic composer. Oh, and it's easy, it's easy to say because a lot of uh, like academic composition is kind of like... Uh, well, there's a lot of politics happening, and a, a very big school of thought that's very prevalent is like, well, you got to be like an inventor. and. You are not. You're like an artist in the sense of what you do, what you feel like. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, you won't go. Oh, clusters are so overused, so passe. You'd be like, there's no need to use clusters. Let's invent a new way of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't care about the politics, so that's why it's sometimes nice to just say, you know what? I'm not a composer. I'll do what I want. Well, you are a composer. It's just not that kind of composer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and then what about that? Uh, and then I recently published a piece before that. Um, mm -hmm. For an unreasonable for, ensemble. Yeah. Um, which is really a bullshit argument. But <laughs> yeah. You know. But uh, oboe, English horn, two flutes. Um, Two guitars, acoustic bass, piano, tambourine, uh, is that it? Oh, and viola. Um, and then, this this is actually one of the songs that I wrote that I want to record on an album later. The one I want to record actually has more instruments. It has um, voice as well. Um, I guess that does not count as instruments, I guess, but it does have two or three more parts added on just for the vocal parts because um, the thing the other thing is I tend to write music for um, what I know I can get together with what's around me so I play and the flutes were actually supposed to originally be um, tin whistle and low whistle and they're gonna be that when I record it but so I play tin whistle low whistle oboe English horn and blah blah Mm -hmm. I can hire some, I, everybody and their dog plays piano, so I can find a pianist if I just throw a stone in the crowded building. <laughs> um, and then there's this dude I know who plays guitar really well, and he also plays viola. Well, just to be fair, not everybody plays piano well. Like, well. Yeah, but the part I was, uh, the part I wrote wasn't super yes, hard. Yes. So as long as they're competent, then, or not competent, fairly competent, then it'd be fine. Um, and then a dude I know plays uh, guitar and viola. I play bass very badly, but the part I wrote wasn't all that hard either. He also can figure it out if there's a part in there that's too difficult for me and I give him time to learn it, he can learn the bass part. So mm -hmm. that's no problem. 
And then singing, I would need to warm up and actually quit being a shy, stupid motherfucker, but I can do all right for an album. I wouldn't want to sing in front of a billion people in an opera house, yeah. but yeah. I'm not doing that. So mm-hmm. because I write for what I know, that has actually gotten me into some weird ensemble situations, but <laughs> that's fine. Um, yeah. So there we go. So um, I have, yeah, I have like sort of a question. Mm-hmm. So when are we going to finally see your metal projects with a lot of metal and a lot of riffs and solos and shit? And when are you going to go on tour? On the North America tour in House of Blues? Uh, I'll never go on tour unless something <laughs> weird happens. Like, unless, like... You published a song unless and like uh, millions of dollars. Yes, like this is dudes, what America needs. Dudes from Enslaved and El and oh fucking Blind Guardian are like, Hey, we're going on tour, we want you to come with us, and we'll be session musicians. And you just have to play the weird stuff and sing, maybe. I'd be like, okay. Um, but for the most part, unless something like that happens, I will not be going on tour. And then the metal stuff, I'm combining with the folk and academic stuff into like a bigger sort of concept album. Um, not really a concept album. I mean, if you make an entire concept album based off of I Get Really Lonely in the Winter Time, that's what are you going to get out of that. Yes. But, um, oh, I don't want to give out the title because people will hunt me down and kill me. Yes. <laughs> um, it had the title has to do with winter and feeling alone, and I'm writing a big instrumental title track that'll have a narrated poem that I wrote at the end, um, and then uh, I have some other metal stuff. I still need to write lyrics and figure things out. I need to buy a sampling program for drums because drummers are the hardest things to find mm. on earth, especially yeah. for metal. Yes. Um, but, I mean, as soon as I have the money for their... Oh, and we need to get a shitty seven-string guitar for my friend, because um, mm. I was a dingus, and I wrote one of the guitar parts in drop A. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, jeez, so, man. <laughs> so he needs a seven-string in order to do that. Uh, I guess, yeah. Um, but he can pitch in to help get that, too, because, I mean, mm. it's not like, what the fuck am I going to do with a seven-string guitar after we're all done, you know? So... He can pitch in with that, and we can just get a crappy one, and he can keep it. Um, and then he can always say, hey, I have a seven string. Um, but, I mean, I'm hoping, now that I, other big news is I got accepted in, on a full ride into grad school. Um, so I'm hoping probably next Christmas break, if I get an assistantship, I'll actually be getting the steady income. So next Christmas break, if I come down, I should have the money for the studio. We can get a guitar do some rehearsals and get that all recorded and mastered so maybe next December or January there will be an album but in stuff not related to that I want to write a a solo piano piece for Beep so Mm. I'm getting that getting that already well I shouldn't say I'm writing it for him but it since it's solo piano I mean who else is going to play it um, yeah, he's he's a monster, yeah. So yep. yeah, is it is it kind of like sad that I don't know? Maybe this is just me, but I like as a composer, I always. Oh, uh, by the way, I also wrote music. Used to now, I just mostly do art, but still could write some music. But as a composer, I kind of want just to sit there and write and not deal with anything else. But if you really want good music and good everything, you either have to be some kind of weird genius, like, very into sound engineering to make it work. Mm-hmm. Like, uh... But... Or alternatively, you have to be very, like, social, know people, make connections, and very, like, entrepreneurish and make things happen, and I tend to be more like, Oh, I am writing this and that, and I'm gonna put it in my table. <laughs> you know, like, just... Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's not gonna make anything happen, and it's sad. But, like, I mean, academic environment is really good for that sort of thing. Yeah, for making connections. That's one of the... That's one of the things where music like studying music formally really really helps because you do make a lot of connections only problem is i made all those connections in the place where we studied that no one will ever know about 
but then I immediately went home to Washington, well, where those connections don't quite matter as much anymore. For now. Yeah. I mean, here's the, here's the thing about networking. You need to keep up the connections, and even yeah. if it seems like it doesn't matter, it, it's still an asset, but you don't c quite know the value of it. So, yeah. So, if, if, by the way, listeners, if you're like a, into art, we're that sort of kind like, of like kind of freelancers, but we're struggling. We're in the beginning. We're in the beginning, what we kind of. We're not even in the, the middle, as, it, as they say. Yeah. So, we're in the beginning of freelancing. We're getting some shit. It's not enough, but. Uh, so, expect a lot of talk about that. But networking is important, and. Like, what we suck at. Well, basically networking, but like we, like, and everybody needs to keep up talking with like people because people are assets. I mean, that's a very sociopathic kind of thing to say, but people are assets, and you need uh, you need them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you need them. But like, it's it's like it's weird because you you know it has to be mechanical, and you need them for the very specific reasons, right? But you can't just I want to like. Here's your update once a year just to keep in touch with you because I might need you in the future. Like, you, you know, like, you can't just do that. So you gotta be like friends with them, or at least in yeah. touch. And sometimes it's hard to do because, like, you really don't care. It's like mm -hmm. hard. Yeah, especially if you're some kind of like antisocial person, which both of us are sort of are, especially you. So. Yeah. So keeping in touch with people, like, like, you could have gained probably more from the people that were there if you were like really trying or working at it. But we, because you see, we grow up in school environment, and in school environment, no, no one really teaches you how the real world works. So if you want and become like mm -hmm. exalted in the way of being an amusing, proper kind of asshole who doesn't have want to talk with anybody, it's fine until. You be realize that you need it for real life, yeah. And you you start learning or find yourself either giving up or deciding to start learning how to be a, like a social person. Like you don't have to be like social, like change your habits, but you need to be social to the point of like you could go to a party and not be embarrassed. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like by the way, my trick. This definitely doesn't work for everybody. Like, hundred percent sure that maybe not try it if you're not sure about it. But just go to the drinks, get drunk, slightly, get slightly Absolutely. tipsy, get slightly tipsy. It will start you getting talkative, friendly. If you find yourself to be not a friendly drunk, do not do that. Oh, or if you have any alcoholics in your family. Also, yeah, I mean, don't ruin your life. Don't, really. don't, don't. <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, this is a thing I wanted to mention, but we, we both, okay, we, we talked with you, right, about this, but I find, like, wanting to return to this all the time, but it's very easy to convince yourself, and I'm talking about yourself, about, like, becoming an artist and being committed to it, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever your art may be. Maybe it's poetry. Mm -hmm. See? And, like, <laughs> the trick is, uh... Yeah, you gotta, um, like, here's the, the, the trick is, in, like, everybody says, like, you, you, you want to make it, right? If you don't make it, quote unquote, like, you're not gonna be successful. Everybody wants to be a successful artist, but it's hard. Like, everybody knows it's hard. But no one re is really sure how it works, business way. So everybody thinks, like, it's just luck or something like that. So what you need is like, basically, yeah, sure, luck is involved, but you need you need like time for that luck to happen. I mean, a lot of people talk about how like look at these uh, actors that got famous later in their lives, even though they were completely unsuccessful early on, right? Some of them even stopped doing acting at one point. But basically, you need to commit to it and keep doing it, no matter what, like day to day. Yeah. Like you will be failure for a while, and it's okay. That's how it happens. But here's the trick that we both 
decided that it's it, it sounds very morbid, it sounds very weird, but basically you need to tell yourself, oh it's easy. Either I'll make it or I die. Mm -hmm. Because here's what happens. When you say that, oh, either I'll make it and I'll be successful and then I'll do art, or I'll be unhappy and I won't do it and you know, but I won't be an artist. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is, see, when you say that, you give yourself a way out. It's a very sad way out, but it's still a way out. Like, like, for example, if you're leaving to some place and your family's like, well, you always know that if something happens, you can always come back to us. You know, like they do that, and it's very nice of them. It's, yeah, it's it is an option if shit goes really down, right? Whatever happens, but. It really does help if you want to make it in some kind of like situation like that. If you just actually say to yourself, not to your family, but to yourself, actually, they're all dead. There is no <laughs> home. There is nowhere to come back. See, that with that thing, you're not gonna actually... Like, the chances of you succeeding are gonna go way off more because you'll be more desperate, you'll try more things. You'll, mm -hmm. like, once shit gets real, you will not give up. Because it's easy to give up when you have a, like a way out. When you don't have a way out, it's either this or death. Like you know, like yeah. either I do it or I'm just not successful, and therefore I'm gonna die. Like, but again, it's I don't mean like if if you don't become successful in five years, just shoot yourself. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> My point is like think like as if death will claim you if you don't become an artist. Like, eventually. There is no timer, there is no limit, but yeah. that's the thing that will happen, you need to... Like, it, I find it very relaxing, because it's easy, you don't think about like, oh, I gotta go back, I gotta go to a place of hey, people that live there and never left the city, oh, this is terrible, this town, I want to go see the lights of New York on Broadway, I'm a, like, a, like a dreamy actress, I want to make it, you know? And I mean, that's a very hard thing to do, by the way, but... If, if you commit to it and say that there is no way out, yeah. chances are failure you'll... is not an option. Failure is not an option. Like probably there is a higher chance of you succeeding. And I think like that's it's, it sounds very morbid. And if you try and explain that to your mom, she will think you're insane and probably tell you that it's a very bad idea to do it. But secretly, this is a great thought. I think for well. Maybe some people, maybe not everybody. I, I wouldn't say I'm sure, but you know, just as a thought. There you go. All right, one more thing that I wanted to say. You, well, while talking about music, remember you were said that you know, like, sad, winter, depressing, lonely, all the mm -hmm. words that you mentioned. I want to plug this album one more time because, all right, for those of you that don't know, which is most people, I have a very <laughs> silent rule like that I don't really talk about. If I see an album and it has really nice art that I love, like really nice, I am obligated by myself to listen to it. That's a very sh kind of like some would say it's a stupid rule, but I just like that rule and I, you know, I'm an artist, so I, I feel like that's what I'm doing. And if I see nice art, I feel like they cared about the thing I care about and I care about nice art for the covers. Yeah. So. I give it a listen, Not most of the time it's not necessarily anything good, I'd be like, yeah, it's good, but I, I'm not keeping it in my library, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the one album that I kept, that I liked the illustration on the cover, and I was like, alright, I'm checking it out, and I loved it. It's uh, it's a very like sad, kind of like ambient -y, minimal album by a project, or a group, or a band, I don't even know, maybe it's one person. <laughs> You never know, really, these times. Like, but the the project is called Anois, or an I don't know. I'm not sure. Anois. I don't know. Spelled A N O I C E, and I've never heard of it before. Oh, they're they're from Tokyo. Oh, that's interesting, right? But they are like very sad, so, interesting kind of like experimental. The album is called The Black Rain, and I've given it a go. And I've listened to it like twice all the way through. It goes to post black at times. It's very minimal. At one time, it actually sounds like almost like Arvo Pert. For those of you in the classical music circles that 
you know what I'm talking about. It's it's very kind of beautiful and also like emotional and uh, dramatic in the good way, and and at times it's very peaceful, very chill, very relaxed. It remi even reminded me of Tor uh, Torlun Ball, which was a very obscure musician slash painter, by the way. I didn't know that, but <laughs> very obscure guy as you mentioned, but. It's ah, it's so nice, and you know I played it. On the cover, you see a girl sitting, like, desperately crying on a hill with her like feet hanging off the <laughs> steep hill, and it's all like black and white. The only color that is her like little, um, little, like uh, bow ties on her shoes, and she's crying, and it's raining, and the album's got black rain. The sky is black. It's it's very sad, very depressing, but very beautiful. So I would highly recommend this thing. So you know, plug, plug, plug. <laughs> yeah, there. You yep. Go. Yep, yep. Oh, by the way, so this is this is something I wanted to mention, but I decided. I mean, we didn't really we don't really care about formatting our podcasts, our show, this show with, that we talk on much i mean it's free form yeah we just have general ideas but um the last episode ended kind of abruptly <laughs> which i didn't care about much but if you're weirding out about the last couple seconds that is our ending theme which i wrote which yeah is composed by my friend here and we're so very proud of it <laughs> so don't freak out that is the ending thing. When you hear that, that means it's over. Yep. Yeah. So, of course, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to mention. Oh, favorite types of candy. I don't have any candy. You don't have a favorite candy? I, I, I hate, I have, have candy that I don't like. I have candy that I think is stupid. Like, for example, I think everybody who likes, um, what are they called, Twizzlers, mm -hmm. is a sociopath. And I've told many people about this that know me personally, but my theory is so, it goes like this. Twizzlers are tasteless, literally tasteless. And you know who else, like, copies human emotion and behavior without really understanding what it's like? Psychopaths because they want to fit in, they don't really understand what love is like, but they will try and dilate their pupils and shit for that, so people think they're one of us, they're normal, right? So they want to fit in, so they eat Twizzlers. They don't understand that it doesn't have a taste. I know it doesn't make sense, shut up. <laughs> but they eat Twizzlers to fit in, but why would you ever actually enjoy Twizzlers? It has no taste. Maybe if you just like chewing, but that's weird. Actually, it's not weird, it's kind of interesting. Tell me more about yourself. You, about you, my you, candy? You, you, what? You no, I'm talking to the listener who might enjoy chewing. Oh, okay. So far that they don't care what they, what they chew, they just want you. That's interesting. But what is your favorite candy? Um, I really like gummy candies. Um, especially, like, I really love artificial watermelon flavor. I don't know why, but I do. But I think everybody likes artificial watermelon. There's something about it. It's, yeah, it's, it's really just, refreshing. I don't know. It's weird. I, I agree. I like it too, but I, every time I eat it, it's just, it's so like good. I feel weird. It's like, hmm, this orange is like tasty, right? But this watermelon is just like weaponized. Mm hmm. Hmm. I, I feel weird about it. Well, it doesn't taste anything like watermelon. For, By the way, I decided. Yeah, I decided that um, pomegranate is my favorite fruit. But and they're the devil to eat. Well, you know, I made the decision. That's my decision. My favorite fruit is pomegranate. Well, and you gotta understand how I, I live eat with it. that. You know how I understand that, like how I eat it. You, you gotta understand. I just take it, right? I crack it open, like in the middle, so I have like two halves of the, the ball. And then, then just smush my face into it. <laughs> what do you think? I'm gonna take like pick those little things out? No, I just fuck. I, mean, I just start eating it, right with the tasteless stuff too, because it adds like texture in with the seeds that are tasty and have have like all the flavor. 
Like, it's all good. I mean, I'm the person who takes a kiwi and eats it with the skin on top. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Well, hardcore. I've, I've known some people who do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm one of those. And I, I just take a pomegranate and I just start chewing it. I don't, like, eat the outer shell, but all the inside is pretty much, like, un unless it's, like, really hard. If it's, like, soft surface, I will eat it. I don't care, I just eat it right. If the seeds are really noticeable, I might spit them out, but I don't really care. I'm gonna destroy my stomach by the age of 50. Yep. We all know that. <laughs> I mean, food is the least offensive thing I do to it. So you know. Why are we talking about candy? I don't know. I like candy. <laughs> Alright. Let's think about this. So you were sitting there, we were like talking about shit, and then suddenly <laughs> you're like, 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 like you're just. I'm, I'm imagining you sitting there, looking like in your desk, like you know how like sometimes you stare into nothing, right? And you're sitting there staring, and you're like, candy. What is your favorite type of candy? You know, like uh, what? How did that happen? And I don't know. I don't even have candy by me. I have Nutter Butters, which reminds me, <laughs> peanut butter stuff is also my other favorite type of candy. Anything with peanut butter in it. Mm. I'm gonna just think that there's a point in the day, during the daylight, where like, like a little cuckoo bird will like just fly out of the sky and without you noticing will like pick at your head and you're like, candy, candy, and you'd be like, yes. That, and that's how it okay. came about, the question. It's, it's like, I would love to hear your, like, like your train of thought up to there, but, you know, thinking of which. <coughs> still, we still haven't seen the spin-off of Breaking Bad. We both like Breaking Bad, but we still haven't seen the spin-off. I, I think we're both gonna watch it when there's more episodes in it, like, a one season at least. So you can binge it! Especially since, like, I don't know if, like, the Better Call Saul is as... Like the same kind of feel as Breaking Bad. I think it's supposed to be more funny. Well, yeah, I mean, it's Saul, but. But it's still the same guy. So, what I'm saying is, they're very heavily in writing, and their episodes are more into, like, connection, and it's, it's, like, it's easier and more pleasurable to watch the episodes back to back. Mm -hmm. Because then it's just like a, a, a stream of stuff, and it's nice. Like, remember that time when we watched, like, uh, we, we caught up with season, like, the first episode, the first half of season 5, I think, of Breaking Bad, and we watched it, and we were like, nice, now let's wait half of a year for the next part, right? <coughs> or was it, like, a couple seasons or something? I mean, like, weather seasons b between them. And then when we started watching the, the last bits, we were just like, I don't really remember much about what happened, like, at the very end. So I personally rewatched it. You didn't, so we were, like, kind of stri struggling to remember some bits of it. Because we have no memory. Especially me. I have no brains. I survive with connect connective tissue instead of a brain. I don't know how it works. I'm just a spider, really. There's web inside my brain. There is yep. no brain, there is web in my skull. Also, I am a banana. I think I'm like... a pumpkin. Pumpkins are tasty. Like if, they're, if it's a pumpkin pie. I like pumpkin pie. Okay, the kids are...